Hi, I'm Amy Hatch, and I'm obsessed with all things Disney. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello, and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones. This week's episode is... We are talking with Amy Hatch. Amy is a longtime internet friend. Uh, We knew each other from the Central Illinois mom blogging world because she was friends with my twin sister. Eventually, we got to work together. Uh, For a time, Amy was a global content director at SAP. And while she was there a couple years ago, I said, hey, if you have any projects that need a freelance Leah Jones, I'm available. And she put me on a project to help be on the team for SAP CX Live, which was an event in Barcelona. And I'm really grateful for her for bringing me onto the team at SAP. I got to work there as a contractor for eight months. This is, I think, a fun conversation We talk about how in her 30s, she became a fan of all things Disney. I've only known her as a fan of all things Disney. And so for me, it was fun to hear about her evolution. You know, we talk about a lot about travel, a lot about Disney properties. So I guess if you are not in a place where listening to people talk about the before times and the vacations that we took, then... Uh, maybe take a pass on this episode. But if you like remembering how good it was to go to Disney or go on a cruise or experience Hamilton or Frozen for the first time, this is a fun episode for that. Something to know about Amy that you can't you can't take away from this episode, but I will let you in on a secret, which is when you work with Amy Hatch and you're at the end of a project, I saw her do this at two different events, um, the closing nights of two different events, which is she walks around the the final cocktail party or the final meal. She finds every person she worked with on a project and she genuinely thanks them for the work and gives them professional compliments that are kind of soul filling and also make you want to melt into the ground. Uh, She is so earnest as a supervisor, and it is a lesson I would hope that I have taken from her. I don't I don't I am not as good at giving genuine compliments and showing gratitude the way she is. But it is uh, an important lesson to learn from her. So this was a really fun episode talking about Disney, uh, reminiscing about the few trips I've taken to Disney properties I wanted to give a special shout out to Nancy Cadigan. She came on board the podcast a few weeks ago to start helping me. She's an audio engineer. I do the editorial rough cut and then she fixes the audio the best she can based on my Zoom recordings. And I'm really grateful to her to be working with her in this in this way. Stay home, stay safe, wear your masks, wash your hands and uh, keep enjoying the things you love. Have a good week. Hello and welcome to Finding Favorites. This is a podcast where we explore people's favorite things and get recommendations without using an algorithm. Today, I am so excited to be joined by Amy Hatch. Amy is someone who, like me, turned um, blogging into a profession. She was first a journalist. And then when we got to know each other, we got to know each other through the world of, of Midwestern blogging. But now she is working for a Syracuse-based agency called Terra where she is the senior director of content. Um, And I'm so excited to be talking with her today. How are you, Amy? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's July 5th. It is sunny out and uh, nobody is blowing up firecrackers outside of my house. So I'm pretty happy. I know last night was pretty brutal around here, but it was not as bad as I anticipated. 
So at least there's that. Good. So how have you, uh, how has this, uh, the great pause been for you? You know, it's kind of interesting because for me, I've worked at home for 14 years and there was no adjustment for me in terms of coming to grips with being at home and doing my job. That's something I had to learn to balance a long time ago. Um, and when I first started my freelance career, which as you said, was, was, bound, was based in blogging, I didn't have childcare. And so I had to figure out how to fit all my work into nap time or TV time. And then eventually I did get a babysitter, but I had really about four to six hours a day to do my work. And I became extremely focused and extremely productive because I had those boundaries. Um, What has been harder is having everybody in the house all the time. So crisis schooling was a challenge. Um, But again, I'm also lucky in that regard because my kids are pretty self-feeding. Um, they're older, they're 15 and 11. Uh, my son has ADHD, so he needed a little bit of, of scaffolding, but um, really enjoyed learning online. And my daughter, who is a um, dyed in the wool introvert, said to me, I've been training for this my entire life. <laughs> um, but that was really, I would say the first two months were okay. I think now that it's summertime and um, you know, we're not going on our normal vacation. We're not having family dinners. We're not seeing the people we would normally see like their grandparents um, during the summertime, during the break. So this has been a little bit more challenging and I'm, um, I'm a little bit trepidatious about what the fall will look like, but you know, knock wood, everyone is healthy and um, we're financially sound, which is more than many people can say. Um, and uh, we're just grateful to, to really be in a spot where we can weather it out. Fantastic. It's so, I'm so glad that this is, I mean, everything is adjusted, you know, it's like, uh, given the state of the world, things in this house are okay. Is how I feel about it. You yeah, know? exactly. And, you know, honestly, it's given us more time together because we, typically are very busy in the summer. We have a lot of lessons in our house. Both kids are musicians and those have all reverted to Zoom, which is great because nobody is required to take them anywhere. Um, Art lessons have paused. Those critiques are happening virtually as well. So in some ways, it's nice to have an actual weekend that's just a weekend. Yep. Yeah, I hear you on that. I had um, somebody asked me recently, between the volunteering I do and, and work, how I found time to start recording this podcast. And I was like, it's, uh, there's two hours a day that I'm not on the train. Mm-hmm. You know, the amount of time I have recovered from by never leaving my house, the, the transit time um, has, uh, after three months, I was like, okay, now I'm ready to do something with the, that time. This was it. This is what I decided to do at the time. Well, I'm so glad because this is my first podcast interview. I've been asked a bunch of times, but I can never make the the timing work. So I'm super excited. Great. So let's not hold people in suspense any longer. (laughs) What are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about my insane, over the top, a slightly obscene love for all things Disney. All things Disney. So now because I know you, I know it includes going to the parks. Yes. I know it includes cruising. Yes, it does. Does it also include all the movies? I have seen, I think, every single Disney movie ever because my children came of age kind of during the golden age of streaming. Okay. And DVD players prior to that. So, you know, all those hours we talked about where I was trying to work were often filled with a wholesome hour and a half to two hours worth of um, Mickey focused entertainment. So, um, and two, I think that, you know, for, for our family of four, um, one of the first shared movie experiences that all four of us, my husband included, really came together and loved was Frozen. Yeah, such a fantastic movie that um, 
everybody enjoyed and we all loved the music. We loved the plot. We saw it multiple times. We went to a sing along because that falls into the, the musical category in our household. Um, it was, it was really, that I think was a, a um, pivotal moment in our collective Disney mania. <laughs> Are you a household? I know that now Disney owns Marvel. Disney owns Star Wars. Are those properties included when you think like I love Disney? Has it expanded to include Marvel and Star Wars or are those different than Disney in your head? They are different and the same. Marvel, we, I was never a big superhero person and we're not typically in this house either, but the movies that we've seen since the Disney um, studios have taken that over, have been very entertaining. I've always been an action movie fan. My husband, not so much. So it's a way for us to come together in the the middle. And Star Wars, I mean, I was seven years old when I saw Star Wars for the first time. Great. I had a huge crush on Han Solo. Never liked Luke. Always a rebel. (laughs) I went as Princess Leia for Halloween and my mom made the gown and I had really long hair. So I had the space buns. Uh, I, my dad was a huge sci-fi fan. So we saw all three of them in the theater. And now it was funny because last week we realized we have Disney plus. Now we realized that the kids had never seen the original star Wars. Oh boy. So they had never seen a new hope. No, they had seen, they've seen, the newer ones, which I can't even remember the names of because I'm old and losing my mind, but the, they've never seen the, uh, what I consider the yeah. original trilogy. The 77, 80, 83. That's right. I think those so, are the years. Yeah. Those are the years. So we are, we are embracing those in our household now, which has led to a lot of other kind of seventies action movie stuff too. We watched alien. We want to watch jaws. So Disney has opened up other avenues to us as well that the kids might not have followed through on with us if we hadn't had that door. Let's go back to the beginning for you. So Frozen is when your family comes together around a Disney product and you get like everyone is like equally bought in, loving a movie. Mm -hmm. But like, where does your Disney story start? 1975. I was almost four years old. My mom was pregnant with my little sister who was born in 75, June of 75. We went to Disney World. My dad was on a business trip. We were, we were very poor. We did not have a lot of money. Um, my dad and my mom both come from, um, my mom working class and my dad actually comes from abject poverty. So when my dad started to climb the corporate ladder as an engineer at Xerox, they sent him on a number of business trips and this was one of the first. Um, So I was born in 71. We went in 75. And I have this really vague memory of being on Space Mountain with my dad. Wow. And I remember also being completely terrified. And for years, I had this really weird dream where I was floating down a river and everything was pink. And there were all these weird singing things in this dream. And it wasn't until more than 30 years later that I went back to Disney and realized that that was, it's a small world. Right. I guess having it's a small world confusingly interrupt your dreams is better than Space Mountain giving you a lifetime of nightmares. I will say that my fear of roller coasters is deeply ingrained. And I do remember my mother many times throughout my lifetime haranguing my father about the fact that he did that okay, and that it was completely inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so what was, um, both Disneyland and Disney world had been opened, uh-huh. but Disney world obviously had a much smaller footprint at the time. What are some of the things in that early visit that you were, so it's a small world was there. Space mountain was there. What else do you remember about that trip or, or have you learned as an adult in your research? The, only thing I remember about the trip, along with those two memories, are, is the fact that I remember having a fresh orange with a straw stuck in it mm. and drinking the orange juice directly out of the orange itself. 
and that was so exotic to me living in the Northeast and on the Great Lakes. And, you know, this is before the advent of the true supermarket. Right. It was just a completely unique experience. Since then, I've actually delved into the history of the park with my kids. Uh, the interesting thing is there's a very long pause in my life where I, I refused to engage in anything Disney. Okay. Tell me about the pause. The pause really was born out of the fact that I fancied myself to be very sophisticated. Mm-hmm. Um, especially after we moved to England when I was a teenager. Okay. And I traveled around a lot at our school. I went to an American school. We were asked to travel as part of our curriculum. It was required. I uh, became slightly unbearable. Some people would say extremely unbearable during that time. And also very cynical. I wanted to be a journalist. I followed the news. The you know late 80s, early 90s were a weird time in our country. Not anything like it is now. I could never have imagined the landscape changing this much, but it, it, there were a lot of disaffected people in my generation. Gen X is, yeah. is who I am solidly. I land there both from an age standpoint and from a philosophical, philosophical standpoint. I did not think that I had an inner child. And so I had disengaged from that. And my parents continued to go every now and then my sister had kids. They started to go uh, mm-hmm. February breaks in particular because in the Northeast, it's miserable at that time. And they kept inviting us to go and I kept saying no. And I finally gave in and we had just the most miserable time. My daughter was two. It was literally the one week of her life where she was a terrible two. So that's, a, that's like an opportunity for the cynicism to thaw, but you have a horrible trip. So mm-hmm. I'm guessing it doesn't thaw or is there like a moment where you're like, maybe I'll do this again? No, I said, I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> Okay, so so that trip when Emmy is to a disaster, you're never doing it again. Something has to happen between that and Frozen coming out, or is it Frozen <laughs> that comes out that starts to thaw your feelings again? What's what's the next either invitation or movie or or what is it that cracks through? So we were living in Champaign, Illinois, which is part of where our connection comes from. Knowing your twin who lives in, uh, is, it, is Lorraine still in normal? Yeah. She, well, she's in outside of normal. Yeah. Outside of normal. So I knew Rain, met Leah through Rain. Um, I was living in this place I was really not happy in. It was very monotonous for me. I didn't have a ton of friends. I struggled. I worked remotely, so I didn't have a active social life. My mom and my sister got together and ganged up on me by offering me a all expenses paid seven day luxury vacation on property at the Polynesian monorail access, all the kind of kid food you could possibly want. Yeah. And it was February. And I thought to myself, I cannot look out my back window one more day and see this flat brown and gray landscape. I have got to get out of here. So by that time I had a son, Henry was four. Emmy was seven, almost eight. It seemed like the right age yep. to bring them. And so I took a leap of faith and it was one of the most magical experiences we ever had. Wow. And that set the stage for my absolute love affair with the park experience, with understanding what drives the park experience and how that expands into all the other work that they do, be it entertainment. We also, um, we took a cruise. We did a three days at Disney, three, uh, five day cruise to the Caribbean on the Disney line. And I can tell you, if someone had ever said to me, you're going on a cruise, I would have laughed them out of the room. Again, truly one of the most relaxing vacations I I had had as a parent in particular. Yeah. I um, also, the only cruise I've ever been on was a Disney cruise. It was, I think it was just a three night, possibly four night 
um, Bahamas cruise because uh, a friend was getting married. Mm, and there uh-huh. were a number of us who were like, well, we love them a lot. And we're going to go on this cruise. <laughs> And we're all going to be miserable together because they're making us go on a cruise that we would never choose. And it was, Mm -hmm. um, it was outstanding. Yes. And immediately I was like, how do we make a plan for like the whole family to go on a cruise together, which hasn't happened yet. Um, and who knows with COVID if cruising is going to be back on my to-do list in the next few years, but it was really Uh, It's everything from like how your luggage shows up in your room to the, the Mickey waffles and the ice cream to the characters on the ship, the character, you know, when you go to Castaway K, um, the like being met by Lilo and Stitch when you get off the ship, uh, it's really a phenomenal experience. And you feel, um, like you trust that it's being done well, that people are safe and healthy. Um, so it really was, it blew my mind how, what a wonderful experience it was. And that's, as a parent who often traveled alone with her kids, all those things you just mentioned made it possible for me to do those things with them. You know, arriving in Orlando, getting on the Magic Express, never seeing my luggage until it shows up in the room. You know, going straight from the room to the pool. Everything at that point was on what they called the key to the world. So you put your credit card, your, it was your room key, your credit card, and your ticket. And so I didn't have to carry any cash. I didn't have to carry my wallet. It was, it was one of the most surprisingly relaxing experiences because you think of Disney World, the parks in particular, as a trip, right? And they are, but they remove all the barriers yeah. to creating those memories and those experiences with the people you're with. That is a really good way of looking at it, that they're removing the barriers from the, I mean, obviously like in the parks, there's decisions to make about ride priority, uh, what's worth waiting in line for, what do you get a fast pass for, what places, you know, there's much more of a, I think, uh, logistics and planning. But yes. you, have, you have a general for a sister, so. That's right, I do. Get to go in so, her wake. Yes. And the other thing that is a, a best kept secret about Disney is that if your child or you has any kind of disability, mental or physical, you are able to get what's called a disability pass. Okay. Both of my children have extreme anxiety. My daughter has severe anxiety and um, OCD. My son has ADHD and severe anxiety. It's very hard for them to wait in line. Yeah. And there's only so many fast passes you can. We found out about this disability pass. We went to guest services. I didn't have to bring a certificate, no doctor's note. They trusted me that I was telling the truth. Yeah. And we got a special pass where if you bring it to the uh, ride operators at the beginning of the line, they will give you a time to come back. Oh, wow. And when you come back, you walk on. That's fantastic. So it's, you're still the 45 minutes that you would have waited in line. You can be elsewhere. You can have a drink. You can walk. Yeah. The fast passes. And I learned all this later, like my operational Disney side emerged on subsequent trips. But this first trip, we also, it's also a place where I feel comfortable letting go of rules. Mm Mm-hmm. Again, because of all the issues my kids have, we're pretty regimented in our house. At Disney, we sleep late. We go to the pool. We go to the park at night when it's its most fantastical and the least crowded and the least warm. It's mostly cool in the evenings. It is a... We tend to go at dusk, so there's that magic hour feel Mm -hmm. to it. It is one of the most beloved experiences that I have with my kids because we feel completely free of all the constraints that we are under in our daily lives. I don't, my phone doesn't work in the parks because you need to be on the Wi-Fi to use the app, but I'm, it doesn't have enough strength for me to check my work email. 
Ah, what a gift. I am not, I'm always too tired to open my laptop. I don't even bring it with me anymore when we go. It, is, it strips away. They, they so magically strip away all the trappings of being a grown-up uh-huh. and being a parent in the way that you have to be disciplined and rule abiding and structured. It just all disappears. And the things that you normally have to structure, they take care of for you. Yeah. Wow. Now I want to go back. Yeah. It, it, you know, I will say though, in the last couple of years, it has become so crowded that it's not as enjoyable as it was during that lull where there weren't so many people going. Um, but the other thing I love about it too, is that people are so excited to be there because they're, they've saved up their whole lives for this in some yeah. cases, it may be the only family vacation they go on. And so everyone is excited and everyone buys into the suspension of disbelief. Right. Yeah. It is hard to maintain a Gen X cool or cynical level once you're in the park. Yes. And and it's just a lot more fun to give in and have fun and buy in. And yep, that's Mickey. And yep, that's goofy. And they're here and they're keep their characters, you know, something I've embraced, I think in the last few years is just, is that it's really nice to be a fan Yes, of exactly. Things and just yes. enjoy things and not with a sense of irony and not with a cool detachment. No. It's just fun to go all in and be uh, and love something, even if it's yes. silly pop culture. I have no chill when it comes to Disney and I don't care. Yeah, I just don't care. And I'm, I'll am i be 49 on July 22nd, which is just a few weeks from this recording time. And I want to feel that way. I want to feel light. I want to feel joy. Disney World gives me joy and it doesn't give me joy in a solo sense. It is a collective joy that I celebrate not only with my my children and now we've sucked my husband in as well. He resisted for a long time, um, but we finally got him uh, on board and it is a place where there is just a palpable sense of joy, excitement, and everybody just letting go of all of these trappings that we feel like we have to have when we're grownups. I went the last time I was prior to that cruise, um, man, I was in, I was in Orlando for blog Orlando. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that was probably 2007, 2008. And, and one of our meetings was on property, like the pre, the day before blog Orlando, we had like an industry summit and that was on property. And then we all got park hopper passes for the next day. Mm -hmm. And so I met up with, um, David Alston, who was at Radian six at the time. If you remember (laughs) using that dashboard. Yes, I do. And we decided to go on one ride in every park. So we got in the rental car and we just drove from park to park and we would go in with our park hopper. We'd say, what's the one ride we're going on here? We went on Space Mountain and he very specifically did also did not like roller coasters. So I uh, still owe him apologies for that. (laughs) Yes. But we were both adults. So we could have we could have not gone on it. He had consent. He, he had the ability cons- to consent. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, he could have noped right out of that line. Yeah. Uh, and I know we went to, there's the park with the animals, the safari one. Animal Kingdom. Animal yep. Kingdom. Epcot was still there. Um, so we went to Epcot and probably had a meal in Epcot. And it was just such a fun day of saying, let's, let's do it. Let's use this park hopper and go everywhere. Yeah. And that was, and just two people, no kids, um, no agenda. That was a very fun day. One of my dreams is to go by myself or with another friend, adult friend who's a fanatic, because I think it would be just delightful to do whatever. Not that I don't love going with my kids. And the older they get, it's interesting because Magic Kingdom was our go-to. We stayed at the Polynesian, so we could be very close. We would take the boat over. We stayed at the Contemporary, so you can walk. We took a trip, just me and the kids, 
I got my first bonus when I got hired at SAP and I impulsively booked a five day trip to Disney for me and my kids during February break, March break. We stayed at the beach club, which is another deluxe resort near Epcot. And you can walk to Epcot from there. It's a real short hop. And it's interesting as they get older, Epcot is more interesting for them because it's more global. There's more to see. We, I remember on that trip, we saw Mulan at the China pavilion and my daughter was 13 at the time. And she begged me to get photos with her because she said, she's my favorite Disney heroine because she doesn't have any love interest. Oh, she doesn't need a man. She just is the hero. That's so cool. And it's very cool. And it's just, it's interesting to watch this kind of evolution in them yeah, and how the park actually caters to all the things you're interested in. Because the last trip we went to Animal Kingdom and did Avatar, which we don't always do. And then we did Star Wars Land at Hollywood Studios. And so no matter how old, how much older they get and how much more they're, their, their, um, the things they love change and evolve. Disney is still there for them. That's fun. We've done some European cruises. So they've actually been to, I think between the two of them, 30 countries. Um, That's phenomenal. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's mainly the cruises we did Northern Europe. They've been to Russia. Thanks to Disney. They've been to Sweden. They've been to Barcelona. They've been to um, the south of France. And I I recognize that I am uniquely privileged to be able to give them these experiences. Not everybody has that, but it has been a way for me to give them some of what I had as a teenager, which was this exposure to the global community. Yeah. Which I think changed my life. Uproot and move again. Exactly. Although if Amsterdam ever had an opening for an Amy, I would definitely go there. (laughs) That's fair. So how are you guys bringing, you know, Disney Plus is obviously, uh, man, did it start like right when quarantine started? It dropped just before. Yeah. So what have you uh, been watching in the, how have you brought Disney into COVID? We watched, they have a wonderful series called uh, Disney Imagineering. It's the history of the parks and how all of them came to be. So it starts with Walt talking about how he went to the playground with his children and he thought, you know, this is great, but there's really nothing for me to do. I want to play with them in a playground. I want a playground we can all enjoy. And that's how Disneyland was born, is that he built a playground that all ages could enjoy together in this fantasy world. And it delves into how all of the attractions we take for granted now were created by this rogue group of Disney studio employees. None of them were engineers. Most of them were artists. None of them had any experience building rides. Nobody did really. And it takes you all the way through from the development of Disneyland to um, Disney Shanghai and how this group of rogue people that Walt ran around and kind of snuck off into this empty warehouse on the Burbank studio lot created these epic experiences out of nothing, just their pure imagination, their absolute drive to do something unique in the world and, and to, to put joy out into the universe. My favorite story is the guy who designed the Matterhorn had never, had no idea how to build a roller coaster. And they made this model and he's like, I want it to look like this. And they said, great. Now you got to put the roller coaster. Oh boy. And he's like, I learned physics. I learned architecture. I learned, you know, advanced mathematics and he pulled it off. And, you know, it takes you through all of the development of, um, that now iconic art that we see in it's a small world. The animatronics were all custom dressed by one woman who went on a quest 
wow. to find every indigenous costume and redesign them for these animatronics. Right. And how they've responded over the years to social shifts. So you may know that um, Song of the South is, is Disney's great shame. Yeah. And in the culture we're in, we're in now, in order to be anti-racist, they have eliminated the vestiges of that from their parks. Right now in Splash Mountain, there is still that Br'er Rabbit experience that is yeah. part of Song of the South. They are eliminating that and they're actually making it a, a Princess and the Frog. Oh, Princess themed, and the Frog. Great. Which is Disney's first princess of color. Yeah. So you really see their evolution of thought, but what struck me the most about it, and we watched it as a family, was how these people didn't know how to do any of these things, but they did them anyway. And to me, that's another part of what I love about Disney's because there's tons of stuff I don't know how to do, but I want to do it. Yeah. And so you, they do, it. you know, yeah. yeah, you just do it. You just, you make mistakes, you figure it out. And especially for our kids who are both artistically and mechanically minded, I think it was eye opening to watch that and really understand that all those experiences that they have had to be created from scratch right right that to, in today's world somebody can i'm sure you can get a master's in that type of engineering right you know there must be schools that are well known for their roller coaster training sure there and there's animation studios that you know cal arts and usc there their funnels for the animators. Our, my daughter wants to be a Disney animator. But before there was nothing. Yeah. And there are going to be things that their generation invents that we, that aren't in school today, that aren't, aren't things that can be taught in the same way that the Imagineers had to be, had to learn engineering for creating a park. There's, there are going to be things that, the, the Zoomers, uh, the, you know, the, the Gen Z create that's going to boggle our minds in 25 years because we, we can't even fathom what that is. Yeah, it's happening now because they have so many more tools than we did. You know, they have, they are digital natives. And so it's interesting because the last bits of this Imagineering series on Disney Plus talk about rise of... Um, I oh, can't remember the, what the name is at, at Star Wars Land, but the new multi-immersive Star Wars attraction at Hollywood Studios is all done in these in this combination of both the physical and the digital realm. Mm-hmm. And it talks a lot about the technology. In fact, um, Disney can be credited with early robotics. The animatronics that are in the Hall of Presidents, nobody had ever built a robot like that before. Sure the rotating stage at Carousel of Progress, all these engineering feats that we take for granted in our current world were actually created by Disney engineers. It's amazing. Which is amazing. And nobody knows that. And it's, to me, when I go there, it makes the experience that much more rich because the minute I walk through the gate or the minute I board the ship or the minute the movie turns on, I forget all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking about doing a, a grand family vacation with just the four of us because most of the time we're with extended family yeah. and you know we're gonna, we wanted to save for the Floridian or the beach club and just do it all the way Lux you know once in a lifetime and now we don't know if we'll ever get back but you know the Disney Plus experience has, has allowed us to relive some of those memories and of course Hamilton I mean the fact that they have embraced Lynn manuel Lynn manuel Miranda, who is my second boyfriend. Mickey is my first. Um, <laughs> you know, we didn't have anywhere to go yesterday and our family is not around. And so we watched Hamilton and that was as fun, as immersive, as exciting as it would have been to go to any fireworks show in town. Absolutely. Yeah, I rewatched, I watched it on, um, I guess it came out on Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I watched the opening number before I had breakfast on Friday morning, <laughs> just sobbed, cried my way through it. And then re- then like at 9 p.m. that night, watched it again. For real. Yeah, that's, that my other, that, that's my other obsession. But if you think about Hamilton and Disney, they are exactly 
it's almost as if they were made for each other because the experience is so immersive of Hamilton and the creativity of building something that never was like that before yep. is a very natural fit for a company that is constantly striving to create new and better experiences and make that fantasy even more real. I mean, now if you, you think about their digital technologies um, at Disney World with the Magic Band, literally everything is on your Magic Band, one touch. Yeah. Um, it's very clever because you just spend a ton of money. But again, it also erases all those barriers of what is reality. Yeah. And that's what people crave now, I think, more than ever in this age where we are just barraged constantly. Even if you don't want to know what's happening in the world for an hour and a half, it seeps in anyway. It's impossible somebody, not to know. It's yeah. impossible. Someone texts it to you. Someone, you see it on a crawler, you hear it in the car, a neighbor tells you it is impossible especially for kids they're they're bombarded Mm -hmm. and it's it's such an innocent experience when you're in a disney environment whether it is watching it in your family room during the pandemic whether it is being on the ship and uh, dining in one of their uh, restaurants where you can create your own animation they literally give you a placemat and they show you how to crayon in an animated drawing. And then they display them all through the restaurant. Oh, man, that's... I did not... I don't think that happened for us on the one I was on. The, one of the things I loved that they did is um, that your waiter travels with you yes. for dinner. Oh, yes. That the wait staff is the same every night of your trip. So you they really make sure that you're, like, building relationships. Like yes, obviously it helps on the tipping out that you can just tip out the last night um, that you're not tipping every night, but that focus on making sure that very quickly things and people become familiar. Yes. You. Yes. We have requested on multiple sailings, the same servers from other sailings and they remember us. Wait, what? How? You can. So I mean, you book so if you far do, in advance. Like, will they book someone on a ship because you requested them to be your waiter? No, but you can ask if you if that person you've had will be present on the staff and the crew during that time period. Okay. If they are, you can request them. We have had the same server, I think, for two of our seven night cruises. And you really do develop a relationship with these people. And Again, there's this element of not having to worry about anything. My kids would show up and um, my son, Henry, loves Shirley Temples. Mm -hmm. And he would always want extra cherries. So the first time he ordered it with extra cherries. The second night, the Shirley Temple showed up and then a plate of cherries showed up next to it. (laughs) That's fantastic. Those small experiences and... You know, if I want to relate this back to my work, I've spent a large part of my most recent career focused in the area of customer experience. And even as a reporter, that was a a key component of my work, whether I knew it or not, I had to build those relationships. And looking through the lens of somebody who understands what it takes to build those experiences from the inside out, my respect for the discipline that the company exhibits around that understanding the investment that their customer is making in their experience. Yeah. And then paying that off when you're there. Yeah. It's such a good point that it is, if you've never had to create from scratch a conference for 10,000 people, Mm -hmm. Uh, it's hard to appreciate the choices that go into the carpet, the signage, the lighting, the lighting, the bathroom locations, the menu, um, how often is trash picked up? What do you do if it rains? (laughs) Places to charge your phone. Yeah. Just the, the simple logistics of the park alone with, I think they said some ridiculous number, Leah, and I would have to look it up, but it's in the multi-millions of people who, who funnel through the parks every year. 
Yeah. And, and I think it is something like 60,000 employees in Orlando. Yes. Yes. And every single one of them is impeccably trained. Yeah. Impeccably. They all wear name tags that say their name and where they're from. Yeah. And you're able to engage with them in a conversation. They, uh, we had one trip where our, my daughter had a sinus infection. It was just miserable. She could not leave the room. It was horrendous. You know, I went to the front desk and I explained that she wasn't able to use her ticket. Could we get refund? Not only did they refund it, they gave my son and I multiple fast passes, more than we could ever have gotten on our own. And then they sent um, a a stitch character stuffy up to her room. And the story behind that is that our first visit to Disney, their first good visit to Disney Uh when I met my son, uh, Emmy and Henry had been watching Lilo and Stitch on repeat. Okay. We stayed at the Polynesian and we went to the breakfast and Lilo and Stitch were the characters. And I have a photo of Emmy with just the hugest, most organic smile on her face. I think I've seen before or since with, with Stitch hugging her. Yeah. And I had mentioned that we loved staying at the Polynesian. I had told this story to the front desk when I was waiting for them to, to process the refund. And later on, a Stitch stuffed animal showed up in her room. That's gratis. Amazing. It, it truly is. They hear you. Yeah. And they hear you and they're empowered to do something about it. They are. And that empowerment is a huge piece of it. So many places do not empower their staff to give good experiences. I had a friend who was, um, I think she was a bartender at maybe a JW Marriott. Is that a place? It is a place. Okay. And everyone on their staff was given like a daily fix the problem budget of like, 150 or 200 dollars of just like this is your daily budget no questions asked fix the problem whether it's sending flowers whether it's like getting a dry cleaning something done that every person was given just to like solve the problem budget and and that kind of empowerment of employees to just not have to go up the ranks to to make a decision to be trusted to make decisions, to be trusted to handle things on their own, I think is really important. It is. And they're also infinitely patient. I think they understand their audience as well, which is something that is critical when you're talking about creating experiences for people, right? They, they know you're hot. They know you're tired. They know your kid's been screaming. They know the lines are long. They know you're maybe not on vacation so much as taking a trip, which is a distinct difference. And they are always incredibly stoic and patient in the face of outrageous demands and disgruntled customers. I've seen it. Um, I can say it's rarely been me. I think maybe once uh, we had an experience that was out of the norm that I was upset about. But for the most part, you know, you have these very, these very, you know, well-trained, well-spoken, well-thought-out responses to those moments of, of upset. Right, which really then helps it live up to expectations. Or you know, exceed them. Or it exceed them. them most of I the mean, time. The yeah. goal, yeah. Yeah, I can't think uh, outside of weddings, like I really can't think of another family event that people plan for and invest as much money in Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a Disney vacation. Yes, because it is infinitely expensive. Um, But, you know, again, I think that the fact that so many people are willing to pay for that experience over and over again speaks to the quality of it. And they do, you know, they, there are levels, right? So you can stay in a budget hotel on property and make, make the, the choice not to be as close to the parks, but you still get that same level of service. You're not going to get crappy service because you're in the, the budget hotel, right? You're still going to get deluxe hotel service. 
I don't know if you've watched this at all, but there is a show on Disney Plus called Fairy Tale Disney Weddings. Oh, you shouldn't have told me that. Um, where they do engagements, weddings. Uh, it is a very fun show. Uh, there's a couple seasons out, uh, and it is sometimes my friend Jasmine and I will watch a few episodes and then. Sorry. One of the things I really appreciate after watching the show is how upfront Disney is about what it's going to cost to have the weddings. Oh, yeah. Like you don't have to submit uh, a date or ask like they they're just like minimum. This garden is a minimum eight thousand dollars. And it's Ooh. only available between seven and eight a.m. Or six yeah. and, you know, this is this one that you can have a wedding between like two a.m. and six a.m. Like if you <laughs> want it, if you want it in front of like uh, Cinderella's castle, it's when the park is closed. Is right. when you can get married there, so you can have a sunrise wedding, and then everybody goes back and sleeps, and then comes back for your reception <laughs> or something. <laughs> It's there crazy. Are, like certain areas of Epcot where they do weddings, but again, it's only like brunch weddings in sure. the morning. But they're very upfront with the pricing, which I appreciate. And they have some good uh, flash mob weddings. I don't know, not flash mob weddings, but flash mob proposals. And uh, so if you just are looking for some delicious Disney reality TV to watch, <laughs> Disney fairy tale of weddings is very fun. Well, I think that uh, I better start watching it so I can save up for my daughter's wedding. She either wants to get married at Disney or on Cape Cod, and either one is going to cost me an arm and a leg. So we're going to have to start saving for that. <laughs> then maybe don't look up the prices. <laughs> well, what, what's what's uh, next for you, guy? Well, I mean, who knows what's next? I guess. I think if I so we've actually been fantasizing, right? We have our, we plan our Disney fantasy trips. Um, we want to do either seven nights at the Grand Floridian and just go, you know, park hoppers, the whole nine yards, do it totally luxury style. Or we want to do the 10 night Icelandic cruise. Whoa. Tell me more about the cruise. So it's, it's up in the Norway area and yeah. it's Iceland and they do two nights in Reykjavik. Cool. So you have, normally you just do one day in port but here they spend two nights you get overnight so you can get on and off the boat at will and enjoy the northern lights um but i will we did we've done alaska we've done northern europe we've done uh southern europe and so iceland is kind of like the last frontier we've also done a bunch of the caribbean ones um but i i really love the european cruises because they do it's European, it's, it's European vacation for people whose kids can't eat regular food. I mean, that's how I think of it. Cause like, yeah. we just go back to the boat and like everybody can eat and everybody can do what they want. Yeah. And there's no, you know, quote unquote weird food or, you know, everybody speaks English. So the kids don't feel, um, uncomfortable, which they shouldn't because they should know better. But the, it's a really great way for families to see Europe if you can afford it. Um, so that the Iceland is definitely on my bucket list. And I think the kids would love that. I remember, I remember seeing once uh, that a couple times a year when they take a ship like over to Barcelona to start the, the European yeah. season, I was like, that would be a cool transatlantic yes. cruise. It's 15 days at sea, which I would totally do on the fantasy. And their new ships, they're building these enormous luxury ships. And the fantasy is our favorite. It's enormous and it's so luxurious. And there's places for you to go where you don't have to be anywhere near your family. <laughs> so, so there's like teen club, there's middle school club, yeah. there's daycare. Everybody can go their separate directions during the day and do whatever they want. Yeah, They're safe, they're cared for. And then we meet up for dinner. So everybody so gets lovely. a break, which yeah. is really nice. But um, mostly we're spending our time fantasizing about what we would do when the pandemic ends and how we want to do four parks in one day. That is our next goal because we've only done three parks in one day. And the kids are old enough now that, that you can set a goal of four parks and have it be like a fun, amazing race style day. And, and yes. that hopefully nobody ends up crying. 
it Only would tears probably, be, probably be my husband who would end up crying. So he may have to stay home. <laughs> That's the other thing too, is that, you know, we started going to Disney without him yeah, because he was in school and had to stay home during the breaks. But that became like a thing I had with just my kids. So it's very special. It's like our thing. And then we let dad in. Uh So now he's in the club, but you know, he's not of the club. He's a (laughs) junior varsity member of the club. That's right. He's a junior board member right now. Yeah. He makes no decisions. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Amy, this has been so fun. I knew you liked Disney, but I didn't know how much you love Disney. So this is, this has been wonderful. Now you have context for all of my crazy tweets and and Facebook posts. I know. I know. Now I'll I'll understand uh, so much more of what you and Rotul talk about. Yes. Yes. You should have him on to be my my follow-up. Is there anything that you would like to plug or people should, uh, if you want people to follow you on social media? Yeah. I mean, follow me on Twitter. Um, It's at Amy Lynn Hatch. That's L-Y-N. My parents forgot the second N. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I, I love to meet new people and I especially love to meet people who are passionate about a lot of interesting things because the more I can learn from other people, the more experiences I can have and the broader my worldview becomes. Great. Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a good uh, rest of your Sunday afternoon. Thanks. You too. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.